thank you so much for joining me today. I am super thrilled to be joined by Boston Ballet principal dancer, John Lamb. Hey, John. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, we're gonna chat a little bit about John's journey in dance and he's gonna share some, some you know, inspiring insights with all of you to sort of help you all move forward on your path in a positive and mindful way. So John, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about your backstory in dance? So I'm a kid who basically came up from no art background. My parents don't have any education in dance and none of my cousins or uncles are in dance. So it was very much, um, dance came in a very organic way, I would say. I'm a, I'm Vietnamese American. My parents are refugees from Vietnam. So I grew up in California and I went into this like small little recreational ballet school, like very, very small, only boy, all girls. Um, that was my experience as a child being introduced to dance at age four. I got into it by kind of mistake because I was in a child care center and a inner city program came to our child care center and said, hey, does anybody want to dance? And so we rose our hand and they took us to dance class. And I thought that I was going to meet other boys at first. It kind of freaked me out when I was the only boy. Um, so I decided to quit for one day. But the um, coordinator was like, hey, listen, we have a field trip going on that weekend. Let's, um, let's decide later. I'm like, okay, fine. So we went, I just remember going to see a production at San Francisco Ballet. And I remember just loving the music and loving the costumes and also realizing that there were men on stage and there were a lot of men. So it made me realize, oh, okay, so it's not just like all girls and me randomly <laughs> taking class. So that's what I thought, you know, when you're four years old, like everything is like mega zoomed in your world. And so I decided, okay, I'll go back to dance and I'll like get back into it. So I did that. I was very fortunate. Um, I, I get a lot of questions of asking me um, if my parents ever pushed me into going to dance. And I would say I'm very fortunate that my parents didn't have that educational background in art. And I, and I say that just because dance really came um, to me organically and I dove into it because I wanted to dance, not because my parents wanted me to dance or someone else wanted me to succeed through their eyes versus just really truly, truly finding and honing what dance is to me as a person and as an artist. So growing up, my life was just going to act school and then training for like three or four hours a day at this recreational body school. Um, when I was age 12, that's when I met my first male role model, which was Miko Nisinen. He retired from San Francisco Ballet as a principal dancer and he succeeded my ballet school called Marin Ballet and was there for three years. And he essentially just kind of like, like spotlighted me, I guess, or put a spotlight on me and said, hey, like you're pretty talented. I think you can make this into like a pretty good career. You should really think about it. So he inspired me to, to go for it, I guess. And he left to go to Alberta Ballet. I stayed. And then another director um, named Cynthia Lucas came and succeeded the school. And she was a prima ballerina at National Ballet Canada. And she said the same thing. And she said, hey, you should go to a pre-professional ballet school. So at that time, many dancers at my age, I was around 16, no, not 16, sorry. Um, I was around 14, 15, auditioning for summer school programs and trying to figure out, you know, where I want to go year round. <clears throat> but my parents were very much like, no, you have to stay in California. You have to stay in Marin. That's where I'm from. And it was very hard for me to really just travel and go to places that I wanted to go. But... I was able to go to National Valley School, and I was in there for a summer, and they offered me a full ride there um, for the remainder of my training, which was three more years, grade 10, 11, 12, and they also offered academics at the same time and dormitory. So it's pretty much like a dormitory, it's like a, a boarding school for dance on crack a little bit, because <laughs> you would go to school from like 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., have like half hour break, and then 
from like two to like seven thirty would be training. So that's a lot, and and also like keeping the academics up. So my parents allowed me to go. I was very thankful. Well, okay, I take that back. So they didn't really allow me to go initially. Um, there was a whole big epic question of why wouldn't they let me go, and that goes into another conversation, which I'm happy to go into. But my parents were very much like, you can't go because we don't want you to be gay. And I was like, what? I was like, what does it have to do with me being gay and dancing? Which is a very like uh, taboo question that we all talk about in society and kind of like figure out like, you know, what is it with sexual orientation and dance? How does that correlate together? And why is it an issue? Or why is it a discussion? So I knew in my heart that I needed to dance. And I knew in my heart that I needed to leave the house to like, find my passion and, and develop where I needed to develop because I met all these people that kept pushing me and saying, hey, like you should like really think about going to like a pre-professional body school. So I was in a recreational body school that like, I mean, I was the only boy and there were like, what, 10, 20, 12 kids at a time. So it wasn't really serious. Um, but I was able to just go for it. And, I, and of course, I, I told my parents, I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna be gay. like." I'm, I'm just going to go and focus on my, my training. So fast forward, I was at the National Body School for three years. And then after I graduated from National Body School, um, I think it's like in any, any, any boarding school, any training, when you hit the age around 17 or 18, you either start auditioning for companies or you go to competitions or, or send your resumes. Um, and I was very lucky that Miko Nisinen, who I met prior in my school training year, then he went to Alberta, and then he succeeded Boston Ballet. And that was his second year as director at Boston Ballet, where he invited me to come to Boston Ballet when I graduated from Asher Ballet School. So it was kind of a weird, like, puzzle that all kind of came a little full circle a little bit. And all I knew about Boston Ballet was Miko. I knew nothing about Boston. I knew nothing about the rep. I knew nothing about the history of Boston or Boston Ballet or who the dancers were. I just knew that there was this one man that I met when I was about 12, 13 years old who believed in me and lost touch because he went to go somewhere else and then invited me to come to his company. So it was, uh, it was, it was I don't know. When I think about it more and more, it's it's kind of amazing how it all happened because it, it all kind of happened naturally. It wasn't that it was forced or anything. So I jumped and I went to Boston Ballet. Um, now, initially, before I decided to go to Boston Ballet, of course, I auditioned for other companies. And my dream company was to go back to San Francisco, was to go to San Francisco Ballet, to be closer to my parents and be with my family. But I never really had a true opportunity to go audition for them. Um, Nico kind of like had this unspoken kind of territory of like, you're going to come work for me and you'll be fine. So I'm like, okay, well, I just, I guess I have to just like trust the process, which is very daunting and very scary because of course, when you're that young, you want everything and you want the best of the best. And you want to make sure that you make the, the right decisions in order to have like a quote unquote successful career. Growing up, my parents always instilled in me of being just like, is, was always being a good person. And, and I think that really just instilled in me as a child and as a person, as a man, as a dad, as a dancer, um, growing up, just because that's all we can do what we can control is that uh, we can control ourselves of, of being a good person. And I just remember, you know, hearing that when I decided to go with Boston Valley, because I remembered, well, Miko is a good person and he's always watched out for me kind of. And I'm just gonna like go and and just see what happens. So I arrived at Boston Valley as a they call it BB2 or which is Boston Valley Two. It's like their apprentice program. Stayed there for a year, and then after that, I've been with Boston Valley for 17 seasons. So that's 17 years <laughs> now as a principal dancer um, at Boston Valley, and it's been an epic journey. Um, I wouldn't say it's been easy. Um, I've incurred uh, one major injury that really helped me back for about two years. 
I would say one year physically, and I would say about two more years mentally. And that's something that a lot of dancers can't really prepare, prepare, prepare for. Um, but I was very lucky that the schooling that I got at National Ballet Canada, they really educated me on just your self-worth and your, and your, and your self-health of a, as a dancer versus just like doing everything just to please someone that's standing in front of you. And that really instilled in me of like finding that fine line of not having a, an ego per se, but understanding your body. Meaning like if you just know that you're hurting and it's something that's prohibiting you from actually um, dancing at your, at your height, then, then you need to address it versus you're just having aches and pains or you're just tired or lazy. Those are two very different things that I think that um, sometimes dancers get confused with because you know, you can't confuse laziness versus like you're actually hurt and you can't like bend your knee kind of deal. But um, I learned that a lot with National Ballet Canada and that really got me through my first initial injury, which I tore my ACL and meniscus. And that um, was a major thing for me. Um, and I got through it and I fought back and came back, got, became stronger and uh, kept going. Meanwhile, meanwhile, with my dance career, I was very lucky in meeting my husband at the same time. I met my husband about, oh gosh, nine years ago, I think. Yeah, because the injury was about nine or 10 years ago. So when I got injured, I had met my, my future husband. And um, it was a very weird time for me as a dancer because my life was only about dance, all about dance, 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 dance friends, dance this, dance topic. It was like dance, 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 dance. And I didn't really think about anything outside of dance, um, which I think is, we always talk about it, right? I think that a lot of podcasts talk about it. I think a lot of articles talk about it. I think that there's a lot of research that talks about how being a whole dancer is very important, not just like um, focusing on one particular thing for the rest of your entire life. I think it's incredible that people can do that. I don't, I'm not taking away from other artists and athletes that are able to, um, to just dive into that one particular aspect of their lives con constantly. I think that's an incredible aspect, but I, I believe, just me personally, believe that if you can't falter and you can't fail, and if you can't think outside of the box and have a different perspective, then your end game of the result of what you're trying to put on stage can't grow as much as it can grow if you don't have all these other aspects that you deal with in life. I think that we think that, oh, we need to just train, 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 and then you'll just get that job or you'll get that promotion or you'll get this. And I just, I have to disagree. And I only say that just because I've been in the profession for 17 years <laughs> and I came from the bottom and I've got knocked down with injuries and I still came back and I still worked really hard. And I, I went through so much that I understand, I, I guess I could say that I understand what it took for me personally to get to where I am now. And for getting to that path was to just be mindful about about everything and to have an open an open lens. I think dancers has have a closed lens where we we um, are quite self self centered. Actually, I think dancers have to be. Um, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it's the culture and society and dance where you have to have this like self centered kind of mindset. But I think the test of an artist versus a dancer is that either dancers just get stuck in that that circle or you're able to get out of it and become an artist which therefore at the end you get recognized and you can grow um i think there's two ways going at it and um it, it's actually a very complex conversation to have because it, you're going at it in two different ways but i, I don't want to get off topic <laughs> i'll go into that later but so met my husband got married came back and then I had two kids um, that are age five and three. So it's 
it's a busy household here. Meanwhile, I'm dancing crazy and I'm able to sustain my household and my career at the same time. So that, that in itself, I think I am the, I think I'm going to, I am the result of trying to make sure that I have, um, I guess a quote unquote wholesome life. I don't know. That's a, that's a very, could be a scary word to say because that's very subjective to depending on who's saying it and who's perceiving it. Um, but for me, um, I've made sure that my life is not just about dance. Dance is my life and is that as an identity of who I am, but it's not all of who I am. All of, of who I am are many facets of a human being. I think human beings have many layers of who they can be. It's just a matter of, it's, it's a matter of if we are able to allow ourselves to develop all those different facets of who we are as a human being. So if we allow it, then we can be inspired and, and find new ways and in, in different ways um, of developing as an artist. And I say that just because, for example, tomorrow is my, my, my film premiere of a dance, short, a short dance film that I created with a professor at Emerson College here in Boston. And we worked on it for about two years. It's a short, small little film. It was very much experimental. But now it's becoming this thing <laughs> where I'm kind of like, oh wow, it's, it looks pretty cool, it's nice. And, and it's um, low budget, but, um, but the way that it has been created, the process of it has been incredible for me. And it's just another lens of expressing my art. I think as students, we all strive and are thirsty for art. And when we're young, we don't really know what that means to us. You know, like when you're 17, 18, you don't know what, you know, we know of art, we see art, we see amazing artists, but we don't know what art is to us. And I think that that's like, a big question that we need to instill in all our students of saying, what is art to you? Like, what is art to you? Is it, does it mean like being more physical? Does it mean more, being more contemporary? Does it mean more super classical? Does it mean more turns? Does it mean being this, being, there's so many facets of the possibilities of what art is to someone. And I think that question is not asked enough to our, to our younger generation. And it's, it's actually our fault. It's it's all the older generation's fault. It's all the it's societal. It's a society. It's a societal. If that's a word. Fault because we generate our information to give to the younger generation of what's trending or what is worth uh, giving the information to these young young generation. And I only say that because when I see Dance Magazine or Point Magazine or, or Dance International, not to throw these magazines or editorials down the drain, it's just that they're pivoting only information that they know that their readers, which is usually a younger crowd, of what they want. And so of course you have to cater to what younger, young generations want, right? In order to make sure that the magazine sustains. But at the same time, then I challenge the editors and I challenge all the, the people that have the means to have the lens to, to educate the generation, to ask these questions and to like expose these questions so that the younger generation has opportunity to be like, oh, I never thought about that way. It doesn't mean I have to go to a competition and doesn't mean that if I go to all these competitions and hire this person and hire this person and get that kind of choreography that I'll be guaranteed to be the best dancer there is. Because I find that there's this underlining like um, tone where it's like, you know, there's this white GP extravaganza that, that I'm so thankful and grateful that I, that was not my generation. That is this generation. Everybody goes and trains and competes to, to get a job, to go to these generation. And I think it's incredible. I think it's incredible that at the same time, I'm like, well, is it a business? Or is it really, are we really trying to prepare our younger generations to be mindful, strong, beautiful artists that are out there? 
or are we just making money off of them so that they go and compete and feed them these smoke and mirror lies of what dance can be? And I'm not afraid to say that because I'm like, I see all these competitors who win these competitions. They come and audition for companies and they don't get jobs. And then they wonder why I spent all this money, all this time and all this effort to go to the competitions and I can't even get a, I can't, I can't even get a core contract. So to me, that makes sense of like, well, because directors are not looking for competitors. They're looking for artists. They're looking for dancers that can be groomed into these beautiful artists. Because at the end of the day, as I go back to the initial question is, what is art to us? What is art to you? And so if it's just about getting a job or if it's just about getting the gold medal from a competition, then yeah, all for you then. But if it's to have a longevity of a career or if it's about creating a stamp for who you are as an artist, then I'm like, then let's rethink about that. Like, let's, let's you know, we go to school and we, we, we do critical thinking about topics that are very hard in, in academia. Do the same thing in art. Do the same thing in our, in our art world. Like, critically think about your art to who you are, what identifies you, what 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 determines what you want as an artist what excites you what makes you want to like say oh i don't like that that's not for me what makes you open what makes you inspired i mean all these things that we don't talk about because i think that we get so segregated in a corner of just like okay like you just have to like get it done you know you have this attitude of like you just need to get it done you just have to like go to the competition and get that gold medal, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm, it, doesn't always, it doesn't always add up to that, you know? I love your journey. And I, lo I love that all of these nuggets of wisdom just kind of came into sharing that. I am curious if you could look back at yourself when you were going through the injury and stuff, is there any, any advice you would give yourself now having the perspective of what you learned? Yes, so my injury, the if I were to tell my injured self now what I would have what I should have done different, I would say like it's going to be okay. And to also truly take your time to come back and take your time to assess what you need to do to get back stronger. I think as dancers unfortunately time is always not on our side time is always clicking there's never enough time and at the end of the day your career will will stop and it's only because we can't dance for the rest of our lives so there's that there's already that pressure um for us as young dancers and i think when i was when i when i was injured all i could think of was i need to get back i need to get back i need to get back and now when I look back at it, when I look back now, I'm like, dude, I could have taken more time. I could have spent more time just kind of like chilling out and allowing my body to heal. And I always, you know, when I, when I meet other injured dancers or if there's a dancer that gets injured, I always go up to them and say, hey, like, you know, this sucks, A, it's not easy. But at the same time, I'm always like, you know, take your time. Like, this is a time for your body and your mind to heal. And I only say that because I think injuries come upon us because you always wonder, why does one dancer get injured and why another dancer doesn't? We did the same thing, but obviously we were different DNA and our bodies take different things and uh, the environment affects us differently. And I truly believe that injuries happen because either our mind and our body is t trying to tell us to like slow down or like to take a moment back and so if we're not able to listen to ourselves then our body will just take it away from us and i know that's a very like <laughs> out there like thought process but i don't know i i i i, I have to believe that because when i see other dancers that are on top of their game and they all of a sudden just aren't either taking care of themselves and then all of a sudden they incur a major injury. 
I wonder, wow, if what about what if that person would have been more mindful of who they are or mindful of their, about their body and listening to the body of when it is time to push and when it's not time to push, would they have had that injury before? And there's always that question, right? Like I always ask that question, what, what could I have done to prevent from tearing my ACL on stage in front of thousands of people during a show? And it was amount of pressure that, has ha that happened. I was pressured into doing this role. I just got promoted to soloist. So I felt like I needed to prove myself. So when you're already putting yourself, yourself silenced and you're only doing something because of someone else's choice, not your own choice, and you're not listening to who you are or to what's happening, something's bound to happen. And unfortunately, that happened to me. And I would just tell, you know, a day, it, if you were injured right now and you're going through it right now, I would say, take your time. It's going to be okay. Because at the end, you will come back because you love dancing. If love is your, what truly your passion is and it's your fire, you're going to come back regardless. So take your time in getting better so that when you get back, you're fully, you're fully back. The worst thing is to rush a rehab back and coming back half healthy because then you're about to get injured again. And then we you know how, what, what is it to sustain another injury after another injury? It's not healthy. You need time for your body and your mind to heal. And the other aspect is to really surround yourself with people that really love you and care for you. I think that was the number one thing that I didn't allow. When I tore my ACL, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my parents, I didn't tell my brother, I didn't tell, um, I mean, I had friends here at Boston, but I kind of just like went in my own little, little like hole <laughs> and I didn't allow anyone to really like help me. I had my best friend to help me. She was the only one who helped me um, through the injury. And then of course my future husband who I met and, and I allowed him to come into my life, but those are the main two people that basically helped me. I didn't allow any of my like mentors or my te past teachers or my parents to help me. And it was only because I, I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed that I was injured and that I didn't like, I wasn't strong enough to like sustain this kind of injury. And so I would say to someone to allow someone to uh, allow someone to help you. I didn't allow people to help me. And I think I was too proud. I was too proud to allow anyone to help me. Um, and it's just so much harder. It's so much harder when you don't allow someone to help you. And so I would say, allow people to help you. Allow someone to cook for you. Allow someone to get you groceries. Allow someone to get ice for you and drive you to your physical therapy appointments. Like Allow that to happen. Because um, so I think our dancers are... We're highly competitive because it's such a highly competitive art form that we just want to do things on our own. Um, and sometimes you just have to, to lean your weight on someone to help you heal uh, much better than to be on your own. And I think that that is why I was able to see different light when I met my husband because he, he allowed me to learn that. He allowed me to learn that I can rely on someone else to help me because as dancers when you're in a company you have to rely on yourself when you're in the court of ballet you have to rely on yourself and you have to rely on your colleagues too because you're in the court of ballet but at the end of the day you have to rely on yourself and so it's hard for us to rely on other people if that's what we're trained and conditioned to do so i guess those are the two things is to take your time in getting back and to allow someone to help you um, and meaning like really help you, not just like, hey, like I'm fine, but like really like truly like allow your barrier to come down and be okay to be sad about it. It's fine to be sad about it. It's, it's fine to feel miserable about it. That is a process. Allow yourself to cope and then move on. I think that sometimes dancers get caught into, there's like three categories, there's like, there's like, a, it's like a line. It, you, you, there's like three different categories and the, first category is that if you don't if you just like allow yourself to just like be detrimental to yourself you're just in this like dark hole 
and you just spiral down and you're just not allowing anybody to help you and you're not being mindful about anything. You're just like putting yourself down from these injuries. And that is just, that that's detrimental to your career in general and as a person because you're not allowing yourself to like grow out of that. The middle part is like kind of allowing people to come in and still kind of being miserable. And it's like that gray area, right? Like I think that the gray area is very good. I think that one has to go through the gray area, but the caveat to that is that you have to move onwards, forwards, whatever it is, <laughs> jump forward after you allow yourself to go through the gray area so that you can grow, so that you can heal, so you can get to your rehab, so you can get things done, so you can be more um, productive with yourself. It, it's not productive for yourself if you're just going to allow yourself to just commiserate and be miserable for the for the whole time of rehab, I think that you go up and down, up and down, up and down. And what had helped me with my rehab was that my physical therapists were incredible. Not only did they push me physically, but they were also kind of like my psychiatrist. And that's the other thing too, is I, that, that's the other thing we don't talk about is mental, is not mental illness in dance, but the psychology of dance. I think that that's a very, um, we don't talk about this a lot. And I think it's a huge thing that we need to talk about because dance is not just physical. It's, it's mostly psychological than physical. Your psyche is what determines if your body is going to be able to successfully be able to create what you've been rehearsing for the past five months live in front of a live audience. It's your psyche that psychs you out that you're going to be dancing in front of, I don't know, 10,000 to 50,000 people to be, to remain calm and to control your nerves. It's your psyche that's like very important. And when you get injured, it, it gets very uh, demolished down. And I think that that's the number one thing I would have, I would have done was to seek help um, with someone that specializes in dance or in high caliber um, athletics to help an athlete get back to where they were, or even better. Um, it's easy for me to say that now, but I think it's also very hard because I don't think that there's a lot of practitioners that specialize in dance. Um, and it's a need, I, th I believe it's a need. I'm thankful that Massachusetts has a pretty good dance department here um, that's with Boston Ballet. So we have the resources to go to but I know that it's not everywhere. Um, but I would, I would research that and see if there's, you know, they don't have to specifically be about dance, but I, I do believe that uh, someone that helps you needs to be able to have some sort of sport related background that can help an athlete get back because there's a lot of similarities with what other athletes go through, but they, they need help to get back. You know, you, you, you need to build your, your mental gain back. Um, I was, again, I was thankful with my friends and, and my husband um, who kind of helped me get back into that. But um, those are the aspects that I would highly give my information to. There's also, you know, there's, there's also a people out there that can do online coaching. Um, that is something that's very important as well. And um, you don't necessarily need to go to an office to talk to someone. You can talk to someone via online or, or FaceTime or Skype. Or Skype. Um, so it, it is possible. Right on. I think the, the mindset piece and the psychology of it, you're so right that it has to be addressed. And I do think more and more it's becoming available to dancers. Uh, there is a dance focused psychologist who is based in the UK, but he does have sessions, like you said, online and, and Skype and things like that. So these resources are starting to become more available. But as you mentioned as well, I think that the whole dancer mentality of self-reliance and feeling like we can't ask for help is something that has to also be overcome from a personal standpoint, right, for each individual. Uh, but it's amazing that you learned so much through your injury. And I think that that's something that I always try to tell dancers that I'm working with as well is like, this can be an opportunity if you look at it that way. You know, if you right. seek the growth from this, you'll just come back better and stronger and more mindful. Yeah. 
Yep. So on that same note, do you now maybe come, coming from the injury, you've developed some of these. Do you have any special self-care rituals that help you to feel balanced? Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> I think that, I mean, my plate is very full. I, uh, when I get home, it's all about my, my kids and my husband and making sure that snacks and lunches are being made the night before so that they have their stuff and clothes is done and all of, like, there's all of that in my household. But to address the self-care ritual, I would say it's just being, like, in tune with your, with your body and in tune with your mind. I think that um, we can easily push ourselves to a certain limit and we need to know where that limit is when you can sit, when you have to say, okay, I need time for myself. I need time to like, to get a massage or do acupuncture or to do acupressure. So I have all these different modalities where I can go to, but I don't go to them immediately. And I only say that just because I just don't have the time as a, as a, as a working dancer and as a full-time dad, it's very tough for me to, um, to manage all of that. And of course I would love to have every day either acupuncture or some, uh, our on-call massage therapist that can, that can work on my body. I used to get massages like every weekend. I remember before I was getting married, I used to get massages every weekend. And now it's like, I get it like once every, like once every, maybe once a month or something, but it's only through the company. So, you know, I think self, it's just being self-reliant and self-resilient, um, self-care by eating well, making sure you eat well, and to also just, um, you know, there's different techniques of, uh, of doing things for your body that you don't need someone else. Meaning, you know, there's, there's yoga, there's meditation, there's, there's, um, it's not ball work, but it's like, you can utilize different, um, how would, how would you say it? Like I have like tennis balls and I have rollers. <laughs> like you can utilize different things to help yourself versus going to someone to help you if you don't have the time or if you don't have the money to do that. Um, I love to go swimming. I think swimming really eases my mind because when you're swimming, you don't get to hear anything, even though I know they come out with like waterproof um, air buds and stuff like that to go swimming in. But I, lo I love to go swimming because it's, you cannot get injured when you're swimming. <laughs> Unless you're doing something crazy in the water. But, it, you know, I'm just doing a freestyle swimming and it helps with my heart rate and helps with just kind of conditioning my ligaments, my bones, my body. And um, I don't know, I, th I, think that, I think that self meditation is a big thing. I really believe in that by just, like for me, it's just being in, the, in my house, quiet, no music, nothing on. And just kind of just doing my chores of what I need to do. And I think dancers are always doing that either you're icing or you're doing, there's this machine called the Game Ready. I have a Game Ready machine. Um, it's a, it's like these, uh, it, it compresses your legs also by pushing water in it so that it like compresses and it, 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 it's cold. So these athletes have used it before um, and it's amazing um, just taking inflammation away from your body. You can buy different, counterparts for like calf your knee your back arm your neck whatever it is um and then i also have these other things called normatec boots um and there are these boots where you put on and it's it basically does the same thing as a game ready without the cold it just puts puts air and it basically forces circulation because that's the issue with dancers is that our lactic acid comes it comes really quick and and we're always trying to make sure our body is resilient enough for the next day. And recovery time is never enough. For dancers, we never have enough recovery time, especially when you're in performance mode. Like right now, I mean, I'm in. <laughs> I'm performing in every show and I'm not done until 10.30 and I don't, my body doesn't shut down until 2 a.m. And I have to wake up the next day and go to company class and do it all over again. So the rigmarole of 
trying to always sustain your body to be in its optimal place is a test of trying to make sure you keep you take care of yourself um i think self-research of what works for you um is a very vital thing what works for me is that i drink a glass of chocolate milk every time i come back home there's a there's there's studies with chocolate milk with the protein and the sugar um to make sure that your body's getting the, the right amount of sugar um, so that your body doesn't go into like this lactic acid like soreness, you know, where we're educated in drinking Gatorade and all these other things, but that has just like too much sugar. <laughs> um, but if you research on like just like the typical things like runners, you know, they they do this and 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 what works for them. But for me, those are the things that work for me so far. You know, I don't take ice baths. I don't take hot baths. Sometimes those work for other people. Um, Epsom salt baths and stuff that that helps as well, um, but it's about also trying to get enough sleep. Uh, I probably don't get enough sleep, but getting enough sleep is very vital for your body just to like pressing the reset button every night, um, so that when you come to work or to school or to classes that you're like present versus non-present, um, because that could just lead into getting injured or not being able to be casted in a ballet because you're just like looks like you're lazy or whatever it is um so i think sleep is very important um and just drinking enough water <laughs> you can never drink enough water <laughs> So many good tips. I think that, uh, you know, I think one of the best things that you said was the whole self-research principle because, you know, I, I work with dancers mostly in the area of food and the mindset around food and their bodies and that whole piece of it. Uh, but I get a lot of questions about cross training and, you know, mm -hmm. suggestions in that area. And I, I mostly say dancers are doing so many things now. Like there's such a variety of cross training that goes on you can't know what's going to be best for you unless you try some stuff. Correct. You know, I mean, I, I agree with that because it's like, there's so many, there's so much research out there. There's so much information out there, but all of our bodies react to it very differently than other dancers. One might go to a total vegan like diet or someone can do like only like high protein, low carb. Like there's so many different aspects and so many different ways. And I would just caution all our, listeners out there that there's not one right way in order to be the perfect dancer i don't think there's one there can be something that works for you and then it doesn't work for you because now you need to like do something else that's requiring you to do more energy lifting and this and that whatever but you know it's it's very important that you like you said to research and figure out what is best for you because when you find the right, the right, I guess, it's like making a salad, right? Everybody likes different kinds of things in a salad, right? We know the, we know the premise of the base of what a salad is. So we know that as athletes, we need to feed our, our bodies in order to have energy and be able to dance. So if you don't feed it, then it's, never, it's not gonna succeed as best. It's like a car. If you don't put fuel in it, eventually it's going to break down. Or another analogy is that we can put fuel in the car, but it's like, well, do you put like nicer fuel? Do you clean your oil? Do you make sure that you have enough fluid? Do you have to make sure, like all these things you have to always cross check. And we forget about that as dancers because either we have an image problem with ourselves or we think that you have to be this thin to get that role or you have to be that big to be that strong or to have that look or whatever it is that you're fighting against is that it has not the imagery or or what someone may look at when you're young is not necessarily what the goal is what you want to have and and it's a very touchy subject i would say just because at the end of the day i wish someone would tell me when I was 18 or 17, that if someone doesn't like you or someone doesn't cast you in a ballet or you don't get into that school or you don't get into that company, whatever it is, you should not take that as a detriment of who you are as a person because that is only one person's opinion, one person's opinion. That is, that, that cannot dictate your self-worth. It cannot. 
And that's something that we don't teach our younger generation, that self-worth is a big thing. And that's something that I think all dancers deal with. I deal with it, every dancer deals with it because when we are in a, a big company and decisions need to be made by casting and roles need to be casted and this and that and whatever, and if it doesn't fall the way that you want it to fall, it's hard because then you start to self, you start to self doubt yourself and say, well, is it because I'm not good enough? Is it because I can't jump high enough? Does it mean that I can't turn it enough? Is it because I'm not skinny enough? Is it because I'm not, I have blonde hair or whatever it is, you know, there's so many facets that go into it that the only way that I could say to deal with that kind of issue is that you deal with it, you see it and you're like, okay, I guess that's not, you know, it's not my time. It's not my time to, to be at that company. It's not my time to get that role. It's not my time to do that. And then to move on to another, to move on to another pathway. Um, there's, there's always other possibilities. There's always other doors that are waiting to be open. It's just a matter of us allowing them to open. If we put all our eggs in one basket and say, okay, I'm going to go here and it has to happen. Then your failure is much larger and your expectation is obviously much higher, but it doesn't help you as a person at the end because you're setting yourself up for failure. If you expect something so high and you're putting all your baskets in one basket and you're like, I have to get this job. If I don't get this job, then it's going to like tear me my, it's going to tear my life apart. That's not the way to go. You know, it's, 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 I think the way to go is to be mindful about all these different companies, what the temperature is of what artistic directors are dealing with. If the company is dealing well financially, if they're hiring dancers, if they're looking for tall dancers, if they're looking for short dancers, if they're looking, you know, there's all these things that companies are looking for. At the end of the day, truly, <laughs> at the end of the day, is if you're able to hone your self-worth and your and what art means to you. And when you go out there and you're auditioning and you're putting your resumes out and you go out and show who you are as an artist, no one can take that away. No one can take your, your identity of who you are away because when we're born, we're born with our own DNA and that's us. And if we're able to protect it and to self-deliver it and to hone it, then anyone who's watching you audition in audition will respect that. And either they'll be able to give you a job or they'll be able to help you get a job somewhere else. Because they see that there's something special about you. They see that there's something that you believe in yourself, that you believe in your self-worth, that you believe this versus, versus trying to like paddle forward in, the, in a boat, in the, in the water, trying to like get on the boat when you don't know if you can get on the boat or not. Versus just like, it's like an analogy of, a, of, a, of an ocean, like live in the ocean and there, there, there's so much possibilities in the ocean, right? And it's just a matter of like you being a strong swimmer so that you can sustain those waves so that when there is big waves, you just go through them. And there's another, there's another opportunity when you go past it. So it's just always remembering that, that your self-worth is so much worth more than you think it is and that to be mindful that that you're everyone's special and you just have to remember that because I think a lot of dancers forget that and I see that even here in, in our company here at Boston Ballet when you're in BB2 for one or two years and you don't get a job going going into the main company it's hard it is tough because you see what you want you see exactly what you want but you don't get it because either the director doesn't see you in in the same track track as you do and it's hard, it's very sad, but then feel sad for a day or two and then get back up and go fight for, go, go find somewhere else where someone else can appreciate who you are. This is just one person's opinion. I think that's what has sustained me as, that, I think that is what sustained me in my career for 17 years thus far and being loyal and still dancing with Boston Ballet for that many years. I have not jumped to different companies I have not worked for any other artistic director. So it's almost like a, I'm like a guinea pig <laughs> <laughs> of like believing in loyalty 
I believe in loyalty. I believe in my art. I believe in my self-worth. And I have not had it easy and I have not been given the roles that I wanted. And I've still been able to be mindful and to sustain myself to be the true me whenever I'm on stage or whenever I go to work. And I think that um, we all have to we all have to be mindful and, and to see other people go through the same struggle because we all go through, this, through the same struggle. It's just a matter of if you want to follow that struggle downwards or if you want to follow that struggle and still go upwards. And that's a choice. It's everyone, you, everyone has a choice. You know, everybody has a choice if they want to be in this profession. Everybody has a choice if you want to be an artist. You have a choice to be a competitor. You have a choice to be a healthy artist. You have a choice to be a negative artist you know there's so many choices that we have and it's a, and and it's about just having the information and choosing like what your path wants to be well i think that was so good that that's where we <laughs> have to end like I, I love the self-worth the point the conversation around it and i think too you know that is something that it's amazing because you've really spoken to what I try to do at The Whole Dancer. And it's very validating to hear someone like you who has had that experience in professional dance, because I danced professionally, but it was not for very long. And you know, that was part of why my career ended was because I didn't have the mental tools and I wasn't taking care of myself because I was overwhelmed by all of the pressure. So to have seen someone now who's been in it professionally for 17 years and now, and you're sort of validating these things that I know are so important for young dancers to take on and learn. Uh, it's, it's very awesome to hear. And also it's amazing to me too, that more people are not putting these messages out there for dancers. Right. Uh, right. So I'm very thrilled and grateful for your time and for sharing your insights uh, because I do think that hearing it from you who has been through so much in dance and has had such a long career is really going to benefit the whole dancer audience. Yes. And I hope so. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and I'm My happy pleasure. to be here. <laughs>